Go with me into the book of Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to start reading at verse number 7 here in just a moment. Revelation 3, verse number 7. I shouldn't be hard to follow today. You may. If you want to bring a dessert for uh, this next week, some, maybe two or three of you raise a hand and say, I'll bring in something, a dessert, something festive, something red and green or known for Christmas holiday. Anybody else want to bring a dessert? There's one. Cool. There's another. Cool. There's another. Cool. Good. We got to fix something that Rosie can help us on. That girl can cook too. She, if you ever want a, a good authentic Mexican dish, that's the girl for you right there. It's a wonder Taylor doesn't weigh 400 pounds. Praise the Lord. I, I want to talk to us today about when people, say it with me, people, when people become your roadblock. Turn to your neighbor and, and just tell them, not you. Not you. Yeah. And hopefully you're telling the truth, right? But as a Christian, it is hard to know how to handle adversity when it comes to another person. You say, why is that, Pastor? Well, because we're taught to love our enemies and pray for those that despitefully use you. That's even Scripture, isn't it? And to follow peace with all men. That's Scripture. So we're taught that way. And that's a good teaching. And it's really important that you do. That you're patient and you're kind and you're loving with people. But Jesus told us, beware of men. And every woman in the church should say, Amen, Pastor. Of course, I'm talking about people, not just men. We, we must understand that there are times when people can stand in our way and hinder our walk. That's where we've got to draw the line. Look at me. I'm talking to some of you. That's where we must say, enough's enough. If you're going to hinder my relationship with God, then I must learn how to put you behind me. And I have to go on. I... I want you to understand sometimes you have to go on. Look at me. I'm talking to some of you. You have to move ahead. You can't allow people to continue to block your relationship with God or be your excuse or be your destruction. If so be that you allow people to do that, then shame on you. You must hear me today. Very serious lesson. And from time to time, you have to teach on this. Believe it or not. It's really important. So what did Jesus mean, beware of men? Because the religious crowd is the ones that persecuted the, the church, right? Sometimes it's the religious people we have to watch. Sometimes people will, will cause us harm and destruction and... We want to say, well, that's, that's attributed to Satan, and most of the time it is. Sometimes you just have people with a terrible attitude. Maybe somebody went to the restroom today with somebody, and they look kind of weird at you, and it hurts your feelings, right? So pastor passed me by and didn't even shake my hand. He had a sour look on his face. You know, uh, Sister Tyner, you know, Bless her heart, 
Uh, I just don't think she likes me. But sometimes that's the enemy working against your mind, isn't it? Well, there's some scripture I want to read to you today. And we're going to read about this church called the Church at Philadelphia. Now, the irony is is that Philadelphia means brotherly love, right? And sometimes we... uh, we want to think about the church all painted in rose collar and then everything's wonderful. And the truth of the matter is, sometimes that's where the enemy chooses to hurt us, is in church. Jesus was wounded in the house of his friends. So if the devil can really mess with you, he's going to mess with your relationship with God and your relationship with the church. And sometimes it's going to be the pastor, sometimes it's going to be that you're angry with a church member or something happened that uh, you don't understand. And so the first thing that comes to your mind is, well, I think I'll just quit. Come on now. And chances are, if you've been in church long enough, something like that's happened to you. Just shake your head and smile. Nobody will ever know. The church at Philadelphia was unique in that they had some problems, but it was problems with the uh, people of the Jewish faith that had a relationship with God that was based upon the Torah, the Old Testament, and they were giving the Christian people a hard time. Now, you have to read between the lines here in this letter to kind of get that, but No matter what, or no matter who, it was people that this letter to the church at Philadelphia was primarily dealing with. And you can see that in the way that the letter was constructed. Let us read from verse number 7. To the angel of the church at Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no What's the next word? No man. If you're looking at the old King James. I know some of you aren't reading from a Bible that's saved, but anyway. He he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works, and behold, I've set before you an open door, I've done this for you. And no man can shut it. For that thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Those of you that are pre-trib, you know, that's a verification. If you're a mid-trib, you might have problems with that scripture. Or a post-trib. We'll get into that some other time. Behold, I come quickly. Notice this verse, hold thou that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. For I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is the new Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this church has to strive to overcome. What is it they're overcoming? They're overcoming opposition. They're overcoming people that the enemy's using to try to stand in their way. Criticism. Religious spirits. All of the things that 
the enemy uses. Now, if, if I were to ask you if you've been saved for any length of time, has there ever been a time in your life where people has been your problem, most of you would say, Amen. That's happened to me. I've had people stand in my way. People try to shut doors on me. Or open doors that I shouldn't be falling into. But whatever the case, the enemy chooses to use people. Satan, of course, could have the ability in one way or another to manifest himself, and he's done that. There's people, if you read the story of Lester Sumrall, for instance, he had Satan come into his room, right? The devil could do that. The devil could send a demonic spirit. Right? But what does he choose to do the most? It's not spirits that he sends. It's people. Look at me and smile. And again, we're trained to have patience and love and understanding and live peaceably. And we're trained to to love on people, even people that abuse us and go the extra mile. And all that can be very scriptural. But at the same time, you must learn to hold fast that which you have. What do you have? You have a relationship with God. Someone said, I have the Holy Spirit. I have this treasure in an earthen vessel. I, I, I treasure what God has given me. How many of you do? Isn't it wonderful to live peaceably and have a peace that passes understanding and have a relationship with God and know that if Jesus would come back tonight, you would go to meet Him. And to be able to sit down in the church house and enjoy yourself without apprehension, without any kind of adversity. But does the devil want that? No. So what does the devil do? He creates confusion. He creates doubt. He creates all these issues, you know, and it's people generated. And so when I am trying to concentrate on God, it just seems like this slaps me in the face. That was what, what was happening in the church of Philadelphia. The church of brotherly love was struggling with people that were causing them problems and adversity. Criti critical of them because of this religious spirit. That's why the Lord said, I'm, I'll tell you what I'll do. I, they're not even the church. They're not my church. They're the synagogue of Satan. And eventually, I will cause them to come and worship at your feet. These very... People that are your enemies. It kind of reminds me of Psalms 23. Right? Where he said, you prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So I don't want you to give up because you're struggling. I don't want you to quit because you're having a hard time. That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants to taint your relationship with God to the point to where... You're not enjoying yourself anymore. That serving God becomes a drudgery. And so all I'm doing is trying to find a way of escape all the time. Because I don't want to have to push ahead. I don't want to be steadfast and unmovable and always abounding. Because it's right now, you know, the temptation is to be dissatisfied or to be discouraged. And the enemy is trying to use people to do that. Look at me and smile. When it's something of God, if people really love you, what will they do? They will encourage you. They will try to get you to persevere. Push on. Listen, people that really love you will encourage you to be mature. Look at me and smile. But sometimes it's our friends. And dare I say, sometimes it's 
maybe even a family member. Hum a little bit, it might help you. Even your babies can be used of Satan. Those wonderful children or your partner, your husband or your wife. That happens. Do you remember one of the greatest triumphs of a person finding an avenue in the Spirit and speaking out when everybody else could not do anything but regurgitate what everybody else was saying? Some say you're this, some say you're that. Peter spoke up and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a triumphal moment that was. What a tremendous thing happened that day in the life of the Apostle Peter. And you would think, wow, he is on his way up, really, to be somebody. And then you read verse 21 of the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. And Jesus was talking about how he was going to be crucified. From that time forth, verse 21, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and must suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Oh, how important this word was to prepare the hearts of his disciples for what was getting ready to take place. It was the purpose of God that Jesus was sent to fulfill the most important thing that ever has ever happened to mankind. And Jesus was sharing this with them. But Peter took him and began to rebuke him. This guy that was being patted on the back just a little bit ago, saying, you're blessed. Now he's being rebuked. Now, I realize that's kind of hard to believe, but it happens, right? Even with our friends, people can be used of the devil. They get in their flesh a little bit, right? Doesn't mean that they're Satan. It just means Satan's using them. I dare say there's not a person in the room at one time or another that wasn't used of Satan. Right? Matter of fact, my wife reminds me from time to time She says, get behind me, Satan. I look around to see if she's talking to the dog, and it's not the dog that she's talking to. Peter just, I'm sure, is trying to be cordial with Jesus, but he doesn't realize this was the same tactic that Satan used on Jesus in the wilderness. When he said, all you have to do is bow down to me and all these kingdoms will I give to you. And somebody, you might have missed that, but what he was actually saying, you don't have to go to the cross to get this accomplished. All you have to do is bow down to me and I'll give you all of this. Now Jesus knew the origin of what this was about, so obviously he understood where this was coming from. So what did he do? Get behind me, Satan. I don't care who it is. Look at me. If somebody is trying to step in your way and cause you to do something that's immature, look at me and smile, doing something that's vindictive, doing something that's out of your character, making choices that you didn't hear of from the Lord. Amen. Who is directing your life? Where is it coming from? Is it godly or is it ungodly? If it's godly, then it's going to show attributes of God. If it's worldly, then it's going to show you by the confusion, by the the exact words used, by discouragement, by disillusionment. 
Because it's Satan that's the author of confusion. If you have been told something and you get this weird feeling inside, and you have the Holy Ghost, look at me. It's not time to compromise. It's time to call good, good, and evil, evil. If it's of God, then it will glorify the Lord. Let your light so shine. Let your life so be that whatever you do, you do in full counsel of the Holy Spirit. And that you do it to the glory of God. And if you can't do life that way, then you must step back and say, wait a minute. I don't care how close I am to you. You're not my God. The church isn't your God. The pastor's not your God. Say, Brother Tyner, now this is counterproductive. You need to be careful because you want people's loyalty to the church. No, I'm, I'm telling you right now. It's not about the church and it's not about the pastor. It's about you serving the Lord and doing the things that God has spoken for you to do. And not be moved unless it's of the Holy Spirit. Not be moved. Don't, stand, don't allow anybody to stand in your way. Don't stand in the ways of sinner. But be like that tree that's planted by... Who has deep roots. Who is not moved by every wind and doctrine. By the slight of men. And cunning craftiness. Where they lay in wait to deceive. So when Jesus said beware of men. Was he talking about some of the things that we've had to endure? When he say, let no man take your crown. Does that apply to me? Well you have to fill in the blanks. How are you dealing with the people in your life? Are you surrounding yourself with people that encourage you? That bless you? People that will share the same common interests? Let me shift gears just for a minute. Part of our problem is sometimes we allow people to stand in our way by bringing offense to us. Now, I'm not talking about the fence that goes around your yard. I'm talking about offense. One of my favorite stories is this man at the pool of Bethesda, right? We've talked about this before, but it's really important that you see that people can become your problem by the fact that maybe you're allowing them too much emphasis in your life. That becomes your focus. Some people can't come and sit down and be at peace because of somebody else and what they've done or what they didn't do. Right? How many's ever been to there? The enemy just seems to bring your focus to this particular person. You've got to be careful with that. This guy at the pool of Bethesda had been there, what, 38 years? And he was not getting better. He was getting, you know, to the point where he was getting bitter. And the reason why he was getting bitter is because of people. And we, we want to understand how that people can become our problem. So Jesus comes to him and says, do you want to be made well? What would you say? 38 years with a problem. What would you say? Hey, yes, amen. What did he say? Nobody wants to help me. Then he says, when I try to get in the water, somebody always steps out in front of me. You're missing the point. You're missing your opportunity. That's not the only story that this this tells us as far as this type of behavior. Mary and Martha is a good story, right? Jesus comes by to spend a little time with them. Mary's up, you know, and finds herself sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha's up, but she finds herself trying to fix dinner. 
And instead of enjoying that opportunity to serve the Lord, it's not wrong to serve the Lord. And it's not wrong to get busy in the kingdom, right? There's a time for every purpose under heaven. And if they were going to have strawberry shortcake, somebody had to get up and fix it, right? It's not that what she did was wrong. It was that she was bitter against her sister. Because her sister wasn't working and she thought, now this may sound really familiar to some of you. There's times that I feel guilty. It's true. I'm sharing this. I'm, it's one of those moments where I'm being really transparent with you and I'm making a confession. Because of an evening, I sat down on my couch and I lay back with my pillow right here and me and the dog, the dog's laying up here and I, and Sister Tyner is not a person that lays down, never, hardly ever, hardly ever. She, she can't, she's got to always be doing something. So I hear the vacuum going. So my confession is this, there are times that I feel really guilty about that. <laughs> you yeah, have to preach all day. Uh, here's the thing. People can become your problem in a lot of ways, right? When, uh, when Peter was on the boat and fished all night, didn't catch anything, and Jesus comes to the shore and fixes them breakfast. Remember that story? Peter jumps over the boat, swims to shore. Jesus spends time with him more than anybody else, and he just says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then, then he takes it a step further. And he tells him about the way that he's going to die. Now you may, this may escape you, but Peter knew exactly what he was talking about. He would end up being crucified. So, obviously, you know, if you're not in the right kind of frame of mind, something like that can blow your mind, right? And the first thing that comes out is the actual thing that's really on your heart. And he still had some heart issues because what he said, he looked at John and he said, but what about this guy? Can there be rivalries in the church? Do you have somebody that you're watching that's your rival? Ooh, it gets quiet. He said, well, what about that guy? Pointing at John. And Jesus said, well, now listen. And, and Jesus cuts his tail feathers. I just, y'all know what that means? When you, you clip the tail feathers, they can't fly. So he, he's pruning on him a little bit. And he said, look, he said, if he abides till I come, if he never dies, What's it to you? Sometimes we need to be told things like that, right? Oh, there's, there's story after story in the Word of God about people. Ron and I was talking about the, the woman that, that come and, and was standing there at the time of prayer as uh, Paul and Silas was ministering. And she said, these are the great men of God. and These are spectacular men. You need to hear them. And Paul turns around and rebukes him, rebukes her because she's being used of the devil. There's all kinds of times in the Bible where people become the problem. What do we do when people become our problem? Let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 20. I want to talk about this spirit. If you get there before I do, start talking about it, you're going to see it right off the bat. You'll understand that this is a spirit. In the last days, there's all kinds of seducing spirits. And so in this particular church, there was a spirit that existed 
And we know it as the spirit of Jezebel. Can Jezebel be a problem in today's church? How many of you have ever been taught about the spirit of Jezebel? Raise your hand. This is a hard lesson, but it's one that needs to be taught. It's really interesting. If we, if we want to talk about demonology and things, there are specific seducing spirits that are geared for this last day time. The devil, uh, he understands that if he's going to affect the church, it's going to be by certain types of deception. And so seduction is one of those things that he uses against the last day church. And chances are, you've seen it and maybe have had the temptation to fall into that trap of Jezebel. You say, well, I don't understand. Well, let me kind of clarify things. First of all, let's read the Scripture. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against you, because thou suffereth that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself to be a prophetess, Everybody say religious spirits. To teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication or to be unfaithful and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. So the first thing that we want to talk about when it comes to Jezebel, is she uses seduction. What does that mean? Seducing spirits. She draws you in and brings temptation. What kind of temptation? Well, of course, we could say, well, it's really talking about sexual temptation. But that's not necessarily so when we talk about this type of fornication. We're talking about fornication against God, drawing us away from the things of God into realms that are not, not God-like, but they're anti. And how does that work? In that she is a religious entity. The Bible said, don't believe every spirit. I, I'll tell you what, when somebody comes around and they're super religious, because what you do, you find out that people that tend to be super religious, a lot of times are not genuine. And if you follow their pattern, now listen, I'm telling you something you need to listen to. Follow people's pattern. If they go from here to there to there to there, and they do this and that and this and that, and they're never happy, and they always have a story of why. Chances are, this is a Jezebel type spirit. This spirit always demands loyalty. And the way they seduce you is that they'll be nice about you, build you up, tell you that other people don't see in you what they see in you, and how that you should be thought of more highly than you are. And as long as you go along with the program, you're the greatest thing since gravy. The other thing about a Jezebel spirit is she doesn't like the Elijahs. She doesn't like God's men or women. There's always an offense. Now at first they may come along and man, this is, this is wonderful and you're a great man. Preachers get this all the time. One of the things that worry me about people when they come to the church is if they if they are over the top, buttery and sweetness and oh man, this is, and you're saying, okay, wait a minute, <laughs> get real. You know, first of all, just like Peter, when he went to Cornelius' house, I'm just a man. And the more you're around me, the more you're going to find that out. I'm just a person. This is a church. And a church has by its own nature, People that are saved and people that are not saved. And if you don't say, have some unsaved people in the church and people who have sinned, look at me, even though they're saved, you're not doing what you should. Chances are. 
If you have more than three people in the church, one of them is a Judas. True. You're going to have people problems when you gather people together. So you get real. This is just a church. We're just people. Right? We're not always the greatest thing since gravy. And when people come in and they start doing that, and you say, wait a minute, hold on, slow down. Let's walk together. Let's love on Jesus. We're all people. If the Lord has directed you here, then welcome. We want to serve the Lord together with you. But not this fake, not this phony, whatever, because we start worrying about a seduction. They buy you things. They give you things. The whole idea is to build your allegiance. They build your allegiance and then they expect something out of you. They want you to be loyal to them. So any other loyalty then becomes a threat. As long as you compromise, the Spirit's okay. Of course, Jezebel in the Old Testament allowed people to compromise even though she was a priestess for Baal and she had all these false prophets sitting at her table she allowed the children of Israel to wander between two opinions. That's okay as long as you don't get serious with God and you start to get mature enough to say, now wait a minute. As soon as you draw the line, you become her enemy. She'll cut you off in a heartbeat and she'll say bad things about you. Look at me and smile. No one will ever know it was you. This is is a problem. And this type of spirit doesn't let up. It's trying to draw in just as many as possible. That's why the Lord said, I have something against you because you've allowed this spirit to exist. You haven't addressed it. Well, today... I am. If they go on with life and they let things be and they have their own relationship with God, so be it. Godspeed. But if they can't let it alone and they can't let you alone and they're always pulling at you and tugging at you and saying, be a part of our little group. See, that's Jezebel. She's doing whatever she can to get your attention. That's what she's about. To get you to focus on her. Pull you away from things that are good and mature and healthy. What's good and mature and healthy in your life? When it comes to your relationship with God, what would you say helps you or should be helping you? Well, you're sitting in a place. Why is it they attack your church? Why is it they pull on you to take you away from the thing that's helping you? You need to identify some things. You need to start looking at things. And things need to be revealed to you. Now, I, I don't want to be anybody's enemy. I hate having enemies. How many would agree with that? And again, we're to love our enemies and pray for those that despitefully use us. But there are times that you must draw the line. And you must say, enough is enough, and this can't exist in my life. I will not allow this to pull me down or destroy me or cause me to fail or make me feel good about something or make me feel bad about something that is good. I'm mature enough to make up my own mind. I know the direction that God is taking me. And I don't need somebody to try to make me focus on something else that's negative. 
There's always going to be a sideshow. There's always going to be imperfection. As long as there's a church. But your duty is to follow after God and do what God has said for you to do. It's not about Brother Tyner. It's not about Tabernacle of Praise. It's about being obedient and being in God's will. He has set you in the church as it has pleased Him. That's what he's done. He's placed you into the body of Christ because he wants you to be at a place where you can flourish. And if it's here, welcome. And I pray that you are. There's a lot of opportunities here. And as far as I know, in all of the staff that we have here, I don't see anybody, you know, in a spirit of subversion trying to cause destruction or harm anybody. If I have harmed anybody, you need to let me know. Because my heart is to make it right. And I think, look, I think you know that about me. I think you're aware of that. Or you wouldn't be sitting here today. But when it comes to people that become enemies of the cross, causing confusion, causing, what's the word, derision, and division, and strife, somewhere along the line, people need to say it the way that it is. Somebody needs to be bold enough to speak up and say, this is not right. If you love me, you'll encourage me. You, some of you sit here, you have no idea. All you know is what you've heard. You don't know how many times that Pastor Tyner's reached out to people that I made those phone calls. I don't get up here and talk about that. How patient I've been with people. How many times I've been slapped in the face by some people that you might be running with. I don't get up here and talk about that. Every once in a while you need a message like this. What is it that God wants you to do? What's the end of this lesson? Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Then God will set the rest of your life in place. What did I just say? Seek first what? The kingdom. What your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Find yourself in a situation to where you're becoming very stable. That you're growing in the environment that God's placed you in. Get as far along as you can. This is not a place that you come to where pastor's going to say, this is who you are and this is where I want you to be. It doesn't work that way here. Welcome to our church if you don't understand that. Let me help you with something. My duty is to help you find out what God wants you to do. And then encourage you to do that. If I tell you who you are, or give you an identity, you'll never be happy. You say, well you only use certain people. There are certain people who will stand up and say, I want to do something. Have you tried that? If you haven't, then don't gripe at me. If you want to be used, there's plenty of work to do. There's room for all of you. What you see with me. What you see is what you get. I'm a true, blue, loyal, Person, I'm a throwback to the old pastors. I will tell you the truth when you don't want to hear it. I will be your best buddy and your children's best buddy. 
But when it comes time for correction, you'll get it. Because I know that's my responsibility too. Beware of people. Don't allow people to be your roadblock. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Now God, I thank You that You've given us this time together. And then we've talked about a very important subject. Some folks here have been affected by other people. And it's difficult for them to make an adjustment because somewhere along the line, maybe they too have been a victim. And it's easy for us to believe the worst. Sometimes people have stood in our way and we've allowed the enemy to use people against us and we've drawn offense by that. And what's been bad is sometimes it's been in the church. But would you allow us today a peace that passes all understanding to again enjoy ourselves and to relax and come and sit at the table. I'm reminded of the time you spent with your disciples at the Last Supper as each one of them turned to you and said, is it me? Is it me? Sometimes, Lord, that's our feeling. We look at ourselves, we examine ourselves, and that's not wrong. Would you help us today to be completely focused upon the things of the kingdom? to put our feet under the table, and to enjoy this day that You have given us. This is the day that the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now keep Jezebel out of our midst. Stop her seduction. Stop her in her tracks. We are going to do our best here in our leadership team to keep that from existing in our church. We will not allow Jezebel to do her thing. We will call out that spirit as we've done today. In the name of Jesus.